All right, you know what time it is. It's business time. It's your boy, Big Rich, Queens, New York City, where we get busy. Gentlemen, come on in. Don't mind the haters. They still hating. I could see them. I could see them trying to, <laughs> I could see them trying to get in, but they can't. You know what I'm saying? Gentlemen, wipe your feet on the rug. Throw some smoke in the atmosphere. Just lit up a little bit of PPK. Salute to my GGT crew. You know how we do. Mob Spotlight, let's get busy Sunday afternoon. Umberto Albert Anastasia was an Italian-American mobster, hitman, and crime boss. One of the founders of the modern American mafia and the founder of the boss of Murder, Inc. Anastasia was boss of what became the modern Gambino crime family. He was also in control of the New York waterfront for most of his criminal career, including the dock workers' unions. He was murdered on October 25th, 1957, on the orders of Vito Genovese and Carlo Gambino. Gambino subsequently became the boss of the family. Anastasia was one of the most ruthless and feared organized crime figures in American history. His reputation earned him the nicknames the One Man Army, the Mad Hatter, and the Lord High Executioner. Anastasio was born Umberto Anastasio on September 26, 1902 in Calabria, Italy to Bartolomeo Anastasio and Mariana Polistana. Anastasia's father was a railway worker who died after World War I, leaving behind nine children. Anastasia had seven brothers, Raphael, Frank, Anthony, Joseph, Gerardo, Luigi, who moved to Australia, and Salvatore Anastasio and his sister Maria. In 1919, Anastasia, with his brothers Joseph, Anthony, and Gerardo, illegally entered the United States after they deserted a freighter they were working on in New York City. They soon started working as longshoremen on the Brooklyn waterfront. On March 17th of 1921, Anastasia was convicted of murdering longshoreman George Torino as a result of a quarrel. He was sentenced to death and sent to Sing Sing State Prison in Arsacing, New York, to await execution. Due to a legal technicality, however, Anastasia won a retrial in 1922. Four of the original prosecution witnesses had since disappeared, and Anastasia was released from custody. During that time, he changed his surname from Anastasio to Anastasia. On June 6, 1923, Anastasia was convicted of illegal possession of a firearm and sentenced to two years in prison. In 1937, he married Elsa Bargnesi, and they had two sons, Umberto and Richard, and two daughters, Joanna and Gloriana. By the late 1920s, Anastasia had become a top leader of the International Longshoremen's Association, controlling six local chapters of the labor union in Brooklyn. Anastasia aligned himself with Giuseppe Joe the Boss Masseria, a powerful mafia leader in Brooklyn. Anastasia soon became close associates with future Costa Nostra bosses Joe Adonis, Charles Lucky Luciano, Vito Genovese, and Frank Costello. In 1928, Anastasia was charged with a murder in Brooklyn, but the witness either disappeared or refused to testify in court. The Castellamaresi War broke out between Joe Masseria and Salvatore Maranzano. In a secret deal with Maranzano, Luciano agreed to engineer the death of his boss, Masseria, in return for receiving Masseria's rockets and becoming Maranzano's second in command. On April 15, 1931, Luciano had lowered Masseria to a meeting where he was murdered at a restaurant in Coney Island. While they played cards, Luciano allegedly excused himself to the bathroom with the gunmen reportedly being Anastasia, Vito Genovese, Joe Adonis, and Bugsy Siegel. Luciano took over Masseria's family with Genovese as his underboss. In September of 1931, Luciano and Genovese planned the murder of Salvatore Maranzano. Luciano had received word that Maranzano was planning to kill him and Genovese and prepared a hit team to kill Maranzano first. On September 10, 1931, when Maranzaro summoned Luciano, Genovese, and Frank Costello to a meeting at his office, they knew Maranzano would kill them there. Instead, Luciano sent Maranzano's office four Jewish gangsters whose faces were unknown to Maranzano's people. They had been secured with the aid of Lansky and Siegel. With the National Crime Syndicate, already created by Luciano since 1929, 
After the death of Maranzano, he also subsequently created the commission to serve as the governing body for organized crime. The syndicate was meant to serve as a deliberative body to solve disputes, carve up and distribute territories, and regulate lucrative illegal activities such as racketeering, gambling, and bootlegging, which came to a close with the repeal of Prohibition in 1933. In 1932, Anastasia was indicted on charges of murdering a man with an ice pick, but the case was dropped due to a lack of witnesses. The following year, he was charged with killing a man who worked in a laundry. Again, there were no witnesses willing to testify. To reward Anastasia's loyalty, Luciano placed him and Louis Lepke Bushalter, the nation's leading labor racketeer, in control of the syndicate's enforcement arm, Murder, Inc. The troop, also known as the Brownsville Boys, was a group of Jewish and Italian contract killers that operated out of the back room of Midnight Roses, a candy store owned by mobster Louis Capone in the Brownsville neighborhood of Brooklyn. During its 10 years of operation, it is estimated that Murder, Inc. committed thousands of murders, many of which were never solved. The commission's first test came in 1935 when it ordered Dutch Schultz to drop its plans to murder Special Prosecutor Thomas E. Dewey. Luciano argued that a Dewey assassination would precipitate a massive law enforcement crackdown. An enraged Schultz said he would kill Dewey anyway and walked out of the meeting. Anastasia approached Luciano with information that Schultz had asked him to stake out Dewey's apartment building on 5th Avenue. Upon hearing the news, the commission held a discreet meeting to discuss the matter. After six hours of deliberations, the commission ordered Bushalter to eliminate Schultz. On October 23 of 1935, before he could kill Dewey, Schultz was shot in a tavern in Newark, New Jersey, and succumbed to his injuries the following day. On July 7th of 1936, Luciano was convicted on 62 counts of forced prostitution. On July 18, 1936, he received a 30 to 50 year sentence in state prison. Genovese became acting boss, but he was forced to flee to Italy in 1937 after being indicted on a 1934 murder. Costello now became acting boss of the Luciano crime family. In May of 1939, Anastasia allegedly ordered the murder of Morris Diamond, a Teamster Union official in Brooklyn who had opposed Bushalter's attempts to maintain control of the Garment District in Manhattan. In the summer of 1939, he allegedly organized the murder of Peter Panto, an ILA activist who had been leading a movement for democratic reforms in the union's local chapters and refused to be intimidated by ILA officials. On July 14, 1939, Panto disappeared. His body was later recovered on a farm in New Jersey. In 1941, Abe Relis, a gang leader from Brownsville, Brooklyn, who had been supplying Anastasia and Murder, Inc. with hitmen for the previous decade, was arrested by law enforcement, effectively ending Murder, Inc. Relis decided to testify for the government to save himself from the death penalty. A disgrace! Leading to the conviction of seven members of Murder, Inc. Relis also had information that could implicate Anastasia in the Diamond and Panto murders. Fearful of prosecution, Anastasia offered a $100,000 reward for Relis' murder. On November 12, 1941, Relis was found dead on a restaurant roof outside the Half Moon Hotel in Coney Island. Relis had been guarded at a six-floor room during an ongoing trial. In 1951, a grand jury ruled that Relis accidentally died while climbing down the fifth floor using sheets tied to a heating radiator. However, many officials still suspected that Relis had been murdered. In the spring of 1942, Anastasia allegedly ordered the murder of an associate, Anthony Romeo, who had been arrested and questioned in the Panto killing. At the end of June, Romeo's body was discovered near Guyancourt, Delaware, having been beaten and shot multiple times. During World War II, Anastasia reportedly conceived the plan to win a pardon for the imprisoned Luciano by helping the war effort. With America needing allies in Sicily to advance the invasion of Italy and the desire of the U.S. Navy to dedicate its resources to the war, Anastasia orchestrated a deal to obtain lighter treatment and eventual parole for Luciano. In exchange, in exchange for the Mafia's protection of the waterfront and Luciano's assistance, 
with his associates in Sicily. In 1942, Anastasia joined the U.S. Army, likely motivated by a desire to escape the criminal investigations that were dismantling Murder, Inc. Attaining the rank of a technical sergeant, he trained soldiers to be longshoremen at Fort Indiana Town Gap in Pennsylvania. In 1943, as a reward for his military service, he received U.S. citizenship. The following year, Anastasia was honorably discharged and moved his family to a ranch house on Bluff Road in Fort Lee, New Jersey. In 1945, U.S. military authorities in Sicily returned Genovese to the U.S. to be tried for the murder of Fernandan Boccia in 1934. However, however, after the death of the main prosecution witness, all charges were dropped against Genovese. In 1946, New York Governor Thomas E. Dewey commuted Luciano's sentence and the federal government immediately deported him to Italy. In 1948, Anastasia bought a dressmaking factory in Hazleton, Pennsylvania and left his waterfront activities in the control of his brother Anthony. In 1951, the U.S. Senate summoned Anastasia to answer questions about organized crime, the Kefauver hearings. Anastasia refused to answer any questions. Despite being a mob power in his own right, Anastasia was nominally the underboss of the Mangiano crime family, underboss Vincent Mangiano. During his 20-year rule, Mangiano had represented Anastasia's close ties to Luciano and Costello, particularly the fact that they had obtained Anastasia's services without first seeking Mangiano's permission. This and other business disputes led to the heated, almost physical fights between the two mobsters. On April 19, 1951, Mangiano went missing and his body was never found. The same day, the body of Vincent's brother, Philip, was discovered in Jamaica Bay. No one was ever arrested in the Mangiano murders, but it was widely assumed that Anastasia had them killed. After the death of the Mangianos, Anastasia, who had been serving as acting boss of their family, met with the commission, claiming that the brothers wanted to kill him, yet did not admit to killing them. With Costello's prodding, the commission confirmed Anastasia's incension as boss of the renamed Anastasia family. Costello wanted Anastasia as an ally against the ambitious and resentful Genovese. Anastasia was also supported by Joseph Bonanno, who simply wanted to avoid a gang war. In March of 1952, Anastasia allegedly ordered the murder of Arnold Schulster, a New York man who successfully identified fugitive bank robber Willie Sutton, resulting in Sutton's arrest. When Anastasia saw Schulster being interviewed on television, he allegedly said, I can't stand squealers. Hit that guy. On March 8, 1952, a gunman shot Schulster to death on a street in Borough Park, Brooklyn. Government witness Joseph Valachi, a disgracia, accused Anastasia of ordering the murder in 1963, but many people in law enforcement were skeptical of it. No one was ever arrested in the Schulster murder. On December 9, 1952, the federal government filed suit to denaturalize Anastasia and deport him because he lied on his citizenship application. To take control of the Luciano family, Genovese needed to kill Costello. Unable to do so without also eliminating Anastasia, Genovese looked for allies. He used Anastasia's brutal behavior against him in an effort to win supporters, portraying Anastasia as an unstable killer who threatened to bring law enforcement pressure on the Cosa Nostra. In addition, Genovese pointed out that Anastasia had been selling memberships to his crime family for $50,000 a pop, a clear violation of commission rules that infuriated many high-level mobsters. That was one of the reasons why they shut the books down for a while. As they say, they closed the books. According to Valachi, Anastasia had been losing large amounts of money betting on horse races, making him even more surely and unpredictable. Over the next few years, Genevieve secretly won the support of Anastasia's capo regime, Carlo Gambino, offering him the leadership of the Anastasia's family in return for its cooperation. On May 23, 1955, Anastasia pled guilty to tax evasion for underreporting his income in the late 1940s. On June 3rd of 1955, Anastasia was sentenced to one year in federal prison and a $20,000 fine. 
After his conviction, the federal government successfully petitioned to revoke Anastasia's citizenship so he could be deported. However, on September 19, 1955, a higher court overturned this ruling. In early 1957, Genovese decided to move on Costello. On May 2nd, 1957, gunman Vincent Gigante shot and wounded Costello outside his apartment building. Although the wound was superficial, it persuaded Costello to relinquish power to Genovese and retire. Genovese then controlled what is now called the Genovese crime family. Bonanno would later credit himself with arranging a sit-down where he kept Anastasia from immediately taking Genovese to war in response. On June 17 of that year, Frank Scalici, Anastasia's underboss and the man identified as directly responsible for selling Gambino memberships, was also assassinated. According to Valachi, Anastasia approved the hit and the subsequent murder of Scalici's brother Joseph after offering to forgive his threats to avenge Frank. On the morning of October 25, 1957, Anastasia entered the barbershop of the Park Sheraton Hotel at 56th Street and 7th Avenue in Midtown Manhattan. Anastasia's driver parked the car in an underground garage and then took a walk outside, leaving him unprotected. As Anastasia relaxed in the barber chair, two men, scarves covering their faces, rushed in, shoved the barber out of the way, and fired at Anastasia. After the first volley of bullets, Anastasia reportedly lunged at his killers. However, the stunned Anastasia had actually attacked the gunman's reflection in the wall mirror of the barbershop. The gunman continued firing until Anastasia finally fell dead on the floor. The Anastasia homicide generated a tremendous amount of public interest and sparked a high-profile police investigation. Per the New York Times journalist and Five Families author Selwyn Robb, the vivid image of a helpless victim swathed in white towels was stamped in the public's memory. However, no one was charged in the case. Speculation on who killed Anastasia had centered on Profaci crime family mobster Joe Gallo, the Patriarca crime family of Providence, Rhode Island, and certain drug dealers within the Gambino family. Initially, the NYPD concluded that Anastasia's homicide had been arranged by Genovese and Gambino and that it was carried out by a crew led by Gallo. At one point, Gallo boasted to an associate of his part in the hit, you can just call the five of us the barbershop quintet. Elsewhere, Genovese had traditionally strong ties to Patriarca boss Raymond L.S. Patriarca. Anastasia's funeral service was conducted at a Brooklyn funeral home. The Roman Catholic Diocese of Brooklyn had refused to sanction a church burial. Anastasia was interred in Greenwood Cemetery in Greenwood Heights, Brooklyn, attended by a handful of friends and relatives. In 1958, his family emigrated to Canada and changed the name to Anisio. Gambino was expected to be proclaimed boss of Anastasia's family at the November 14, 1957 Appalachian meeting called by Genovese to discuss the future of Cosa Nostra in light of his takeover. When the meeting was raided by police to the detriment of the Genovese reputation, Gambino's appointment was postponed to a later meeting in New York City. Under Gambino, Anthony Anastasio saw his power curtailed, and in frustration, he began passing information to the FBI shortly before his 1963 death. A disgrace. Genovese enjoyed a short reign as family boss. In 1957, after a disastrous Appalachian meeting, Luciano Costello and Gambino conspired to entrap Genovese with a narcotics conviction bribing a drug dealer to testify that he had personally worked with Genovese. On July 7, 1958, Genovese was indicted on narcotics trafficking charges. On April 17, 1959, he was sentenced to 15 years in state prison. A straight killer. Salute. You know how we do, gentlemen and ladies. Like, comment, and share. Let me know what you're smoking on, and we will talk soon. Salute.